Francisco. Uh, ordinarily, when I come up and start with an introduction, people are like, eh, how are you? So I appreciate your enthusiasm and your energy uh, this morning. And a special thanks to our friends here at the Washington Center. I think they do a remarkable job of educating the next generation of leaders, you, uh, about what goes on here in our fair capital. And I appreciate you coming out uh, and being up uh, this early in the morning when I'm sure, left to your own devices, uh, you, you really might otherwise be predisposed as in bed or asleep. And you know, so I'm proud to be here, and I have to say, I was excited to be invited to come back. I was excited to come and speak to you this morning. And then they told me what I was supposed to speak about. And they said, how Washington, D.C. really works. And I thought, how can I get out of this? <laughs> right? Because you picked a remarkably historic time to be here. right? I mean, either today or tomorrow, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, will transmit articles of impeachment to the Senate. We could have a impeachment trial of the President of the United States as early as Wednesday. And think about that, only the third such trial in American history, and yet you will be here on day six, or it could be day eight, I suppose, uh, to witness part of that trial. And yet I'm supposed to be up here talking about how Washington, D.C. works. And I look at that, and I look at the President, and I look at the Chuck and Nancy show, and I say, with impeachment, with Congress as deadlocked as they've ever been. I've been here for 29 years. As deadlocked as they've ever been, what, if anything, are they going to accomplish between now and the November election? So we'll have to see. But that being said, with the challenge of how I'm supposed to define how Washington, D.C. really works, I'm going to give it my go, so here we go. And as much as I hate to admit it, as much as I hate to say this, I think you're looking at the Washington establishment, me, right? The guy who's been here for 29 years, someone who has worked at Capitol Hill for the better part of 10 years, someone who has worked in the White House for four. I call myself a recovering L. I'm a recovering lawyer. I'm a recovering lobbyist. I think I have a scarlet L emblazoned upon here. Um, so I think I'm really one of those swamp creatures when President Trump talks about draining the swamp. Well, I think. I'm one of those swamp creatures, I hate to say that. Um, but I think he's also going to say, I'm also one of those swamp creatures that he secretly loves. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. And I hope that our talk this morning really resonates with you. Um, as we just mentioned a few months ago, a few minutes ago, I, I teach a course at Georgetown University uh, called the Washington Ecosystem, how Washington, D.C. operates on either end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And when you think about that, Many people scratch their heads and they say, wait a second, did you say ecosystem? And I said, yeah, I just did say ecosystem. And think about it. In nature, an ecosystem, you have all sorts of organisms, all sorts of animals, all sorts of people that are in a symbiotic relationship, right? I mean, their survival depends on what other actors in that ecosystem are doing. And when you look at Washington, D.C., and Donald Trump again says he always wants to drain the swamp, I look at Washington, D.C. as an ecosystem. There are so many different actors, so many different entities within this D.C. corridor that depend on each other, right? Is it Hill staffers depending on their members of Congress? Is it members of Congress dependent upon lobbyists and special interest groups raising them money? Is it people in the White House who are dependent on all of the above? And how do you define who these members are in this ecosystem, and how do they work in this symbiotic relationship. And so that's what we're going to do this morning with our time before we get to your informed questions and inputs, hopefully no criticism, of how this all works and see if we can uh, wind this up before you get one of the best actors. See, I think I'm a warm-up act, right? Uh, I've been around the block a little bit, but the next speaker at 11 o'clock, uh, the former governor of Virginia, Terry McCullough, has been an even larger actor in this ecosystem, although don't tell him I said that. So anyway, so where are we going to start? We're going to start where we are right here, right now, at the eastern edge of the Washington ecosystem. Where is that? That's Capitol Hill. That's where we are right here, right now. And what do we find on Capitol Hill, right? You've got 535 members of Congress. You've got 100 members in the Senate. You've got 435 in the House. And I don't want to be disrespectful, so you've got our resident commissioner from Puerto Rico. You've got the 
a person from the delegate from the United States first. You get the idea, right? So in my class, we talk about the concept of there being two Washington, D.C.s, right? My students look at me and they're like, what are you talking about? Bless you. There's only one Washington. I am watching and I hear everything. See, that's what you get from being a professor. It's like you've got eagle eyes. I'm like, I see that you're not a lot better. Anyway, I always tell my students there's two Washington, D.C.s. There's a Washington, D.C. where members of Congress are elected, and they represent their constituents in their districts with approximately 700,000 constituents back home. And what do they do? They get elected, and they're at home, and they say, I am delivering everything for you. I am working on everything for you. And what do they do? They de-emphasize, by and large, their party affiliation when they go home, right? I'm your representative of Congress. I work for you. You're the boss. I'm here. Then they come to Washington, D.C., two Congresses, right? And I teach my students that once these representatives of Congress, once these United States senators come to Washington, the paradigm switches and it flips. Suddenly, now they're the most, by and large, partisan people you've ever heard. The other side of the aisle is so out of touch. The other side of the aisle is so wrong. And they hew to what Chuck and Nancy tell them on one side. They hew to what Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell tell them on the other side. And of course, there's the Trump equation. And I find it remarkable that those two worlds could not be any more far apart. And it's amazing to me that there is very, very, there are very, very few exceptions to this rule. And one of the exceptions to this rule is a good friend of mine who's the senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. And Joe Manchin always says, and who is a national leader of no labels, he says something that I find very informative that I want to share with you. He said, how can we preach bipartisanship? How can we try to work, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, but as elected representatives of the American people, if the following takes place? We're in session Monday through Thursday. On Thursday, you fly to West Virginia. You come to West Virginia and you bash the hell out of Joe Manchin. You say what a bad guy Joe Manchin is. You say how he's terrible, why we need a Republican, how he's out of touch with his constituents. Then you fly back to Washington, D.C. on Monday and you say, hey, Joe, how was your weekend? After you spent the entire weekend bashing me, saying why I should be defeated, why I shouldn't be in the United States Senate, and expect me to want to work with you. And as a result, he will not fly to a congressional district to campaign against a fellow member of the United States Senate of a different party because he believes that it's wrong to go and criticize your fellow legislator, attack them, fundraise off of it, and then come back here and say, what is a Washington function? And I only wish that we had more of that here in D.C. But as we talk about fundraising, and we talk about those who are in the business of giving the money, those, of course, as I started off, are the ones who are wearing the scarlet L for lobbyists. And what has astounded me as I look at this city for the last 29 years, it's hard to believe, honestly, I've been here that long. I'm one of those folks who I came here at 21, and I said, I'm going to stay here for two years, and I'm going to go home to California, I'm going to go to law school, and then that'll be it. I'm still here. <laughs> so, I say the lobbying industry, and I look at the influence of lobbying and the way that people curry favor with the government, and seek favors, and seek redress from the government. It's a multi billion dollar industry, multi billion dollar industry, where a number of us are allowed to fly the trade. And I should say some of us, because I have not been a registered lobbyist since 2008. Uh, I run my own political intelligence firm. Political intelligence, we'll talk about that, and I'm sure you'll want to get into that in the Q&A period, but political intelligence is only a billion dollar industry, not a multi-billion dollar industry. So we've got a, a lot uh, to make up for. So what is it that I do all day, right? I said political intelligence. Uh, I mentioned that I used to be a recovering lawyer, and I'm like, I still a recovering lawyer, recovering lawyers. But anyway, anyway, so what do I do all day that lobbyists don't do? In the realm of political intelligence, your job is to have a finger on the pulse of what's going on here in Washington, D.C. Finger on the pulse means 
For me, I represented a pharmaceutical company, for example, for the last 14 years. And every Monday, I would go to their internal lobbyist meeting where they would have their internal and external lobbyists. And they'd sit around the table and they'd say, here's what the United States Senate is going to do this week. Here's what's going to go on in the House this week. Here are the fundraisers that we think that you should donate to politicians this week. And they all sit around and they're very happy with themselves and they talk about their insult importance. And then they leave. And then I sit and remain. And I look at the head of the DC office and I said, huh, well, that's really interesting. Isn't it interesting that they told you that here's what's going to happen in the committee, but they didn't talk about this, that, or the other thing? Or here are the fundraisers that they're talking about. Wasn't it interesting that they're hosting these fundraisers at their law firms or their lobbying firms? And they're doing it for their self interest? So my job was to really sit and listen and try to decipher of what their paid consultants were telling them and to allow me the opportunity to say, well, that's great. I think by and large they were accurate, but here's a couple of things that I might want to change. And as you might imagine, this did not leave me being the most popular guy working with my company because the people in the company were like, who's this Ron Christie guy? And why is he contradicting our advice? The lobbyists around the table were like, Who's this Rod Christie guy, and why is he getting paid to contradict what we're saying? But I think it's very important for you all to recognize, and I wish that more firms did or employ people who do what I do, is that you need a fresh, unvarnished perspective where it's not about the money, it's not about the party, it's not about who's going to benefit, but you're actually looking at what the benefit and what the bottom line is for the company that you represent. Right? If you're supposed to be a zealous advocate for those who employ you, your zealotry is supposed to be as honest, as candid, and candidly as brutal as possible if the situation dictates it. And so when I always tell my audiences, you know, I love being a lobbyist and I, I think it's a great job and people are like, lobbyist? You're a lobbyist? I said, yeah. I said, look. When I worked in the White House, my old chief of staff, Andy Carr, used to say, what is the most noble profession in Washington, D.C.? People look at him and say, oh. And he'd say, the most noble profession in Washington, D.C. is that of being a lobbyist. And he'd say, really? And Andy would say, yes. Why? Because being a good lobbyist is being a good educator. And that is really how I view my role and my job as an educator. If you can't explain legislation, if you can't explain what's going on on the Senate floor, if you can't explain why this piece of legislation matters, or this amendment is important, or this amendment should be defeated, if you're not a good educator, if you can't spend the time to educate yourself, to educate others, you're in the wrong business here in Washington, D.C. And so I, I want to make sure that I reinforce that terminology with you because I think being a good lobbyist, being a good public policy advocate is that of being a good educator. And speaking of being an educator, in addition to teaching at the McCord School of Public Policy uh, at Georgetown, I also teach a course, and I wish you guys could join me this Thursday because I love teaching it every spring, at the, at the Georgetown Business School called The Business of Lobbying. And I use that same analogy of being a good educator. But in this instance, when you're trying to teach the next generation of people who will be in the C-suite, people who will be at the forefront of not-for-profit groups, you have to understand what you're hearing so that you can digest that information and make accurate decisions. You know, I found it here in 29 years, starting off as a junior staffer and doing whatever it is that I do now, that in Washington, D.C., there are those who are talking and those who are waiting to talk. Right? There are those who are talking and those who are waiting to talk, as opposed to those who are talking to those who are listening and interpreting what's being said and then waiting to respond. Everybody in this town has an opinion. Everyone wants to show you how smart, how clairvoyant, how funny they are, but do they really listen? And so I say that to you in the context of how do we break down when we talk about how Washington, D.C. really works? How do we break that down between the complex relationship between Donald Trump, the United States Congress, and the ecosystem actors writ large? 
And the easy version for me to say is, it's complicated. So let me break that down for you. You know, for the past eight years of the Obama administration, I think it's been fair to say that many people in the business community felt that President Obama was harsh towards many business entities. And I don't say that as a partisan, I say that as a denizen of this ecosystem. Then Donald Trump gets elected. And then everyone says, oh, we got a Republican, we got Trump, everything's going to be cake, ice cream, and roses. And yet, many of the actors of the Washington ecosystem found that that hasn't actually been true. For one thing, President Trump has said he wants to drain the swamp, right? He thinks that lobbyists, swamp creatures like me, are the worst things ever. You know, these people are the ones who've corrupted DC. They're only responsive to themselves. And yet, Donald Trump has hired more than 100 lobbyists thus far to serve in his administration, to serve in his White House. So it's interesting that the swamp creatures and the swamp trawlers are terrible things until they start working for you, right? And then you look at the president, you look at the administration, and we've seen, sadly, a rash of gun violence over the last several years. Citizens being killed in schools, people being killed by what are deemed as assault weapons. And the gun lobby and the NRA said, oh, well, Donald Trump's on our side, he's a Republican. He is interested in preserving the Second Amendment to the Constitution. But yet and still, as you look at what has happened, Donald Trump has sat down with Democrats. He sat down with the Democratic leadership, and he's looked at banning certain aspects of arms. Like you talk about bump stocks, you talk about limiting magazines, and suddenly the NRA is like, wait a minute, we thought Donald Trump was our guy, and yet still he's sitting down with Shaq and Nancy, and he's talking about things that we, proponents of the gun lobby, find to be unconstitutional. I thought Donald Trump was our guy. I worked for the pharmaceutical industry for 14 years, and we thought, oh, the Democrats, oh, they're so terrible. They want to talk about reimportation of drugs from Canada. They want to talk about price controls. They want to talk about all these things. And yet still, what does Donald Trump do? He's talking about reimporting drugs from Canada. He's talking about price controls. He's talking about all these different things. So Donald Trump's relationship with the ecosystem, I would say, is quite, quite uh, a difficult and complicated one and I say that to you that I think all of the old norms that we've seen are over, right? Republicans are going to do this, Democrats are going to do that. I think with Donald Trump in his presidency and his style of leadership, he has truly broken the mold of what business as usual is here in our nation's capital. And how is that? It's through social media. Right? I am happy that when I worked in the White House, we didn't have social media. We we actually we had a cell phone that was about this big. We actually walked around with pagers. Like, I don't think anybody has a pager. I even have a Blackberry. I don't think Blackberries are. Anybody here have a Blackberry? Yeah, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> so I had my pager, I had my Blackberry, I had my gigantic cell phone. And Donald Trump came in and blew up the political order with 140 characters. And I say with full disclosure, my wife uh, works for Twitter. I even have a little Twitter bird in my water bottle here. Um, and Jack Dorsey, uh, the founder and creator of Twitter, what did he do? He made the situation worse by expanding it to 280 characters. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So now you have Trump tweeting about foreign policy. Now you have Trump tweeting about domestic policy. Now you have Trump tweeting about whatever it is that Trump tweets about. And I admit to you, I have my phone, my iPhone, with my Trump notifications uh, when he tweets. And it seems like the darn thing goes off all the time. And I say that in the realm as we've traveled from the eastern part of the ecosystem of Capitol Hill, where we are now. We've moved to where the lobbyists are uh, on K Street and other denizens of that uh, rarefied air, where I also inhabit, are those in television. So I'm, I'm proud to tell you that I'm the North American political analyst for the BBC. I'll be on at 2 o'clock today if you guys want to tune in. Um, <laughs> but it's amazing to me that the number one rated cable show in America is called uh, Hannity, hosted by Sean Hannity, that gets an average of about 2.1 to 2.5 million viewers an episode. 
I'm on a show called Beyond 100 Days, and the funny thing about this is uh, it was supposed to only be for the first 100 days of the Trump administration. So it was on, and it started taking off because people around the world wanted to know, you know who the heck is this Donald Trump guy. So then it was renamed to 100 Days Plus after the first 100 days. Then the next 100 days passed, and they're like, well, gosh, what do we call it now? So it's been beyond 100 days for about the last two years. <laughs> and so here we sit. And I mentioned that Hannity gets about 2.1, 2.3 million viewers an episode. We're averaging somewhere in the ballpark of about 70 to 80 million people who tune into this show every day. And my job is to decipher, and it's always the same question, and so Ron, and tell us about Donald Trump. And my response is, I don't know what he's doing. He's doing what he's doing on Twitter. Follow his Twitter account. But I say that to you that important actors in this town are those who are involved in television, right? You have pundits, they're a dime a dozen here, and they purportedly are telling you everything that's going on in Washington and why their opinion is so important and how important they are, by the way. I view it back to my Andy Starr adage. My job isn't to tell you how smart I am or how clairvoyant I am. My job is to be a good educator and to take a pulse on what's going on in America today, right now, and try to translate that. So at 1.59 p.m. before we go on the air at 2 o'clock today, I'm going to spend all that time, once I leave you, of figuring out what's going on with impeachment, what's going on on the Hill, what's going on in this Washington ecosystem that I believe our viewers around the world want to know if they say, we only have six minutes to learn about what's going on in the United States. What is that, and why is that important? And I go back to my Andy Carr analogy, and I talk about the importance of education. Look at what's also going on here in town. Look at who the actors are here in this town that when I came here 29 years ago, they were barely here. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Washington Center. I'm talking about colleges and universities, many of whom, many of you, of course, attend these entities. They now have a Washington D.C. office, right? So when I went to school, I went to a small school called Haverford College in, in Haverford, Pennsylvania. We didn't have a lobbyist. We didn't have a D.C. campus. But now you look around. You look across the street. You've got everything from Hillsdale College to Stanford University to Arizona State University. So you mean your school. I guarantee you, most of you have a office here. Most of you have a educational center here. And yes, by and large, most of you in your schools have lobbyists here. And the notion of lobbyists for colleges and universities when I first started working on Capitol Hill was a novel concept. I mean, I worked for John Kasich, the former governor and former congressman from Ohio, and the Ohio State University did not have a lobbyist. Now I think they've got five of them. And it just amazes me when you look at who are the actors, who are the denizens, who are the players, the relevant folks here in Washington, colleges and universities are also spending a lot of time here trying to influence the system. And I, when you look at the who the actors are, I, I wrote this down on the card. Um, it amazes me how much money is spent in this city trying to influence things, legislation, public policy, electing members of Congress, the Senate, and the President to office. And I was sitting in the car and thinking to myself, how much money have we spent trying to elect the president since I worked for one? And so I remember vividly in 1999, Governor George W. Bush said, you know, I think if we spend $75 million, we can knock off John McCain in the primary. And I think if we spend about 100, maybe 125 million, we can win the general. So I looked at the numbers. Uh, George W. Bush spent a little bit more than $200 million to win in the 2000 election. In 2004, he spent $345 million to win. 200, 345. Fast forward to 2008. Senator Barack Obama spent $730 million to win in 2008. 200, 345, 730. 2012, 
Obama spent $775 million to win. Mitt Romney, I should point out, spent $460 million to lose. So then you move forward to 2016. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton spent $768 million to lose. Trump spent $398 million to win, but here's the kicker. He had $5 billion in earned media. Earned media is you turn on CNN, there's Donald Trump. You turn on Fox News, there's Donald Trump. You turn on your radio, there's Trump saying something about something. The people in this town who are responsible for raising money, responsible for getting people elected to office, are raising <laughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars. Thus far, Trump has $165 million raised in cash on hand, and his campaign has said that they want to raise a billion dollars to have his campaign coffers by the time that we get to the general election. I work for the guy who ran and won $200 million. Now you're talking about a gentleman who wants to raise $1 billion. And this isn't just one generation. So I throw that out to you to say that things are changing and people in this town are preoccupied with raising, spending, and otherwise bundling money. And again, I since he's not here yet, if you want to talk to somebody who is a master at this and who really understands this, I would suggest that you uh, ask Governor McCall for his uh, thoughts on the proliferation of money. So now we go to the western end of the Washington ecosystem. Now we wind up in the White House itself. Now we wind up in the most magical 18 acres I think that you're going to find anywhere in the world. And I think that once you work there, there's not a day that goes by, still, I mean, I left in 2004, that you think this is the most remarkable honor and privilege that I've been given in my life to represent uh, not only the Vice President initially, but the President of the United States working in these hallowed Homes. Does anyone know? Well, first of all, has anybody ever been to the West Wing before? Other than watching the television show. <laughs> okay. So if you look back to 1901, Theodore Roosevelt was president. And he didn't like all these people hanging out in his house, right? Because at this point, you had the executive mansion, you know, when you walk by and you look out front for the big uh Lantern's hung. Well, back in the 1800s, and John Adams was the first occupant of the White House in 1800, well, that's not only where the president lived, that's where the president worked. Well, that's also where the president's staff worked. And Theodore Roosevelt said, what are all these people doing in my house? And so he decided to build an extension of the White House. And at that point, the White House was called the Executive Office. And then you had the executive building, executive office, executive building, where are you talking about? And so he decided that that portion of the White House should be called the West Wing, so that you could delineate of where it was in the mansion. So hence the term, the West Wing uh, began. And it's incredible. And I want to give you very briefly, before I turn to q and I want to give you very briefly a little history of how the modern White House has sort of evolved. So if you look back to September of 1935, FDR decided, you know, I've got all these advisors. There's no real centralized advisory system. So how can I organize this place to be a lot more effective and get me the information that I need? And he thought that policy decisions were diffuse. They were all over the place. And so he decided that he was going to issue something called an executive order. And pay very close attention. Between now and November, you're going to see President Trump issuing executive orders. Executive orders have existed ever since President George Washington. And what is it? It is a document that the President of the United States, by being virtue of head of the executive branch, can say, I am ordering those who work for the executive branch to do something or not do something. It has the force of law. The only thing it can't do is circumvent a statute of Congress 
or be unconstitutional. So, if you look back in recent history, President Obama issued an executive order dealing with DACA, dealing with undocumented students whose parents brought them here to the United States when they did not have legal status. If you look at President Bush, he issued an executive order dealing with stem cells, dealing with how you can use these for medical research, for scientific research, or how you can't use these. But look very carefully because when presidents get frustrated, when they're in gridlocked times like we are now, and President Obama famously said this, he said, I've got a pen and a phone and I intend to use it. Well, they use that pen, they use that phone to draft an executive order. But let's go back to the 1930s. And so FDR said, you know what? I am going to, by virtue of the authority vested in me in the Constitution, I am going to create something called the White House Office. That's it. That's all he did. And yet still, ever since 1940, this is the first time that you saw it mentioned in the Congressional Appropriations Act, they started funding this White House office. So when I worked in the White House, I worked in the White House office, WHO. And so he did this to bring a sense of order to a system that was rather chaotic. And I would note to you that there are only three times that Congress has stepped in to dictate what the president should or shouldn't do with this White House office since 1940. First one was 1947. 1947, you had the creation of the National Security Council. And the White House campus was relatively small, didn't have that many people in it. And then in 1947, things really changed, right? You had the Department of Army, you had the Department of War, and pardon me, you had the Department of Navy, you had the Department of War, and you had the State Department. So when you look at the modern executive office building, up until 1947, that's where those entities were. And I, I say this as a non sequitur. It's so cool if you have the chance to go there. Look at the doorknobs, right? If you look at the doorknob and it's got a lightning bolt on it, that meant that it was a Department of War. I am a lawyer, as I mentioned. My office was the office of the Judge Advocate General for the Navy. So my doorknob had a little anchor on it. And it's so interesting. Oh, and so of course the Department of State, it's got a little uh, olive branch on it. And so when I worked in the White House, I spent a lot of time, and it shows you what kind of guy I am, looking at the doorknobs. I'm like, where am I? Who was here before me? But there are only three specific instances where Congress has stepped in to say to the White House, hey, you need to do something. Number one, as I mentioned, 1947, uh, where you created the National Security Council. And Congress said, well, you need to have a National Security Council headed by an executive secretary. That's it. Second time, fast forward, 2002. Nothing since 1947. Fast forward to 2002, they created the Homeland Security Council. And then subsequent to that, they said that if you're the president, the vice president, the vice president-elect, the president-elect, by statute, you must have Secret Service protection. That's it. So there are only three instances where Congress has decided that they want to delineate responsibilities or entities that the White House must undertake. And I just want to very briefly share with you that the modern White House, if I've talked about its genesis with FDR, the modern White House can be traced to President Eisenhower. Why is that? Eisenhower enhanced the role of vice president by allowing President Nixon to attend cabinet and national security council meetings. So think about this. You're talking about someone who was elected in the 1950s. The vice president wasn't in the cabinet meetings. The vice president wasn't in national security council meetings. Eisenhower created the position of White House Chief of Staff and Deputy White House Chief of Staff. He created the national security advisor position. He created the cabinet itself and began to have regular cabinet meetings. And he also brought live television into the White House. And he was the guy who decided, gee, wouldn't it be really interesting if we had a helicopter land on the south lawn of the White House? And I'm going to rename that place up there in the mountains in Maryland. I don't like it being called Shangri-La. I want it named after my grandson, David, which became Camp David. 
Every president since Eisenhower has left their stamp on the modern White House. President Kennedy gave the vice president an office in the White House. So think about this. Now we're in 1961. Before that, the vice president didn't even have an office in the White House. He didn't say the West Wing. The White House. It would take until President Carter <coughs> came along in 1977 that Vice President Mondale actually had an office in the West Wing. It would actually take until Gerald Ford became president that the vice president actually had a residence at the Naval Observatory. When Gerald Ford became president, he was living, as I do, in Alexandria, Virginia. He was riding back and forth on the parkway, coming to the White House, coming to work. And they thought, you know, maybe we should kick the chief of naval operations out of the Naval Observatory, give the VP a place to live. And so every president has had the opportunity to have their mark on the White House. After the Bay of Pigs, President Kennedy created a situation room so they could monitor what was going on around the world. I would say that those 18 acres are truly magical because you never have any sense of what goes on behind those walls. But I would say that regardless of whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or whomever it is who's the president, you have the opportunity to work with the best and the brightest and to see some of the most incredible things uh, in the White House. So that's it. We've gone from the eastern side, from Capitol Hill, we've gone over here to the western side, to those 18 acres, we've looked at those Scarlet L lobbyists and all those denizens who are doing whatever the heck it is they're doing for a very, very brief snapshot on how Washington, D.C. works today. I hope this worked for you. Work for me. I wrote it last night. Um, but more importantly, the, the fun part of this is to hear your questions, comments, no criticisms, and to hear your voices to this conversation. There are two microphones on either end of uh, the room here. So if you've got a question, a comment, no criticism, step up to the mic. Thank you all so very, very much. Washington, D.C. ecosystem that you described, once people get elected, like a lot of people grow up thinking I, they want to go into public service for the greater good and not for selfish reasons. Um, but once they get here, do you believe this ecosystem corrupts them and they just give in? Or do you believe that it's generally a restraint on their you know, greater good intentions? That's an excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's both. I think the vast majority of people who run for Congress do it for the most noble of reasons. They're policy experts. They were in the military and want to defend the military. You look at a number of members who maybe had a spouse who got killed in a gun attack and they want to come and do gun control. I think the vast majority of members come here for the right reasons. But you get some who go native on you, right? And they get here, and there's nothing more awesome than being called congressman or senator. And you get driven around all day. And you start to believe your own self-importance. And I just look at my old boss, uh, John Kasich, and I, I think it's so important for people to represent their constituents. But after a time, wherever that time is for you, go home. Because if you don't, and by the way, we're talking about these Scarlet L for lobbyists. Who are a lot of these lobbyists? These former members. They can't, they just love this place. But to be optimistic to you, most of them are here for the right reason. Thank you for that. Sir. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. So, President Donald Trump's obviously a very unusual candidate, and you mentioned, or President, and you mentioned that. Um, business as usual has changed with President Trump being in office. And I was wondering if you could expand on that and explain whether or not you think that's a good thing for the country. Right, so we didn't have social media in the Bush administration. They had it for President Obama. And Obama, would, when he would sign a tweet, would say B.O. so he knew it was actually Obama. So President Trump, for disrupting business as usual, as I said, tweets all the time. 
and his staff is flummoxed all the time. Because, you know, you go to a cabinet meeting, you go to a policy discussion, you think, here's the policy, here's what we're going to do. And then you get, boop, boop, and there's a tweet notification, and Trump has just blown up everything that you thought that was subtle policy. And I think what he's also done is you hear him talk about fake news. No one's ever treated or talked to the media this way before, ever, right? It's the media, it's the fifth state, it's so this. And he has taken that and blown it up on his head. And you look at his new press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, she hasn't had a White House press briefing in over 300 days. Most presidential administrations have a press briefing every day. So how has he disrupted the system? The system is no longer the system. I mean, he is his own one-man wrecking ball. But a lot of people like that. And it's a phenomenon for those of us. Remember I started off saying that I am the establishment, right? I've worked here forever. I need to go home. I do go home to San Francisco every week. Um, don't know what to do with them. It's fascinating. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Angelica from Stanford University in Boston. And the question that I have for you is, when working as a lobbyist, what do you consider to be your most prominent achievement? That's a very interesting question. And I, I would say to you that being a lobbyist is being a good educator. And as a lobbyist, it's not just that you're working for a corporate entity or a corporate client. Um, I remember on the second or third day when I came in, I was the Vice President's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor, and he handed me something uh, which is called a Dear Colleague, and it's, it's written to fellow members of Congress, and it says, Dear Colleague, uh, every year since 1915, legislation has been introduced to have a black museum in Washington, D.C., chronicling the achievements of black people in America. The VP handed this to me and said, get this done. And I thought, okay. And I threw a remarkably difficult negotiations where I got schooled by the Office of Management and Budget. I decided a smart version of Ron would be to go to talk to Congressman John Lewis from Atlanta and figure out a way to generate congressional support for this. And my greatest accomplishment as a lobbyist uh, took place on December 15, uh, 2000. And free. And that's when I went to the White House Chief of Staff, Andy Carr, and I said, Chief, they passed the Black History Museum bill in the House, and we go out of session in two days. Can you get the President to call up Bill Frist, the Senate Majority Leader, and ask him to pass this by unanimous consent? And he's like, We're dealing with other stuff. And then the phone rang, and he said, Can you come over here? I said, Yes, sir. I came over and said, You tell him yourself. And so the picture that I have that I have the most pride in, other than, of course, my wedding photos, <laughs> um, is a picture of me breaking the president. I said, Mr. President, every year since 1915, blah, 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 HR 3491, can you call the Senate Majority Leader and ask him to pass this by unanimous consent? And he walked over and said, get Bill first on the phone. <laughs> and uh, he actually did it. And so the picture is me briefing him, and the greatest accomplishment is getting a phone call and said, can you hold for the first lady? And I said, sure, and I said, why is Michelle Obama calling me? And it wasn't, it was Laura Bush. She said, Ron, if it weren't for you, we would not have the African American Museum of History and Culture as part of the Smithsonian, and we want you to be our guest for the opening day. And um, it was it was truly remarkable, and I, you can see that it's still uh, gets me emotionally to, to be able to drive past that every day when I'm here in Washington and think I actually did something when I was in government. Hi, yes, um, my name is Samantha Murdoch. I'm from Connecticut University. Wait, you're not from Suffolk? <laughs> Role in many of the different actors in this ecosystem that you talked about, which role do you feel was the most crucial to not only your career but to how this ecosystem actually functions in Washington? You know, I, I think 
the easy thing to say is, oh, my time the last, or oh, when I worked in the Hill, or you know, I made money on the lobbying and lawyer circuit. I think really the most important thing that I've done here uh, since 2014 is to teach. I love teaching uh, at Georgetown. I particularly like teaching undergraduates. I've been teaching at NYU. Because again, remember, everybody's got a campus in town, apparently. Uh, I like teaching you guys. Um, I just spent the last semester at USC, by the way, which is a trip. Like, all my students would come to class like on their skateboard, and they hit the back of them, and they put them up on the wall. I'd never seen anything like that. <laughs> uh, my greatest gift when I left USC uh, last month was they gave me a skateboard. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what the heck to do with it. <laughs> um, but in any event, I think it's being an educator. I think it is trying to teach students, you all, the lessons that I've learned here in town, uh, the things to try to emulate, the things to not duplicate by my mistakes, I think is my most important um, contribution to the ecosystem. And I love it. Teach on Thursdays. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, is it morning? Good morning. Uh, <laughs> Um, my name is Peter Silva, and I go to Suffolk University. Of course you do. I'll call me Riv now. Um, and my question is very similar to Gabriella's, um, but I'm asking one because my professor is keeping track of who's asking questions, <laughs> and also because I would like further insight into this. Um, so I like the analogy that you used about Washington being an ecosystem, and. Um, and I would agree with you in the sense that it is, but I have a problem with it. Document. <laughs> um, so my problem. Um, TikTok I, I watch a lot of national um, geog like geography, and then I see a lot of things that there is a hierarchy within the ecosystem. And um, I think similar to that, we see a lot of people who have more money and more privilege just taking advantage of those who are less fortunate. And um, I was wondering if you could give more insight as how do we get the line to recognize um, the importance of the gazelle within the ecosystem and the interdependence of everything. Well, you know, the gazelle for all the National Geographic in Washington, the gazelle always seems to lose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, keeping score, I think we've got uh, three <laughs> subjects and we've got a Knepiak and we've got, anyway. Um, you know, I have truly found that the most important voices are not the hired guns like mine. Um, the former, since we're talking Suffolk and since we're talking Boston, the former Speaker of the House, Tim O'Neill, had a very powerful uh, statement that he said, all politics is local. And I would say that to all of you, when you look at Washington, D.C., when you look at this ecosystem, that all politics is local. When I worked on the Hill, did I want to talk to the hired gun from Ameritech? No, I wanted to talk to the future farmers of America from Columbus, Ohio. Did I want to talk to the hired gun from Pharma? No, I'd rather talk to the person from Wendy's. Wendy's, by the way, uh, is headquartered at Wendy Thomas. She's actually my age, a real person. Uh, Wendy's is headquartered in our district. So you might think that the lion is always going to get the gazelle, but the gazelle, to use your metaphorical reference, if the gazelle comes home, you want to talk to the people from home rather than the lion who you think is king because they can raise all sorts of money and purport to have all this influence. You want to talk to your constituents because those are the ones who elect you. Thank you, sir. Okay, are we from Suffolk? Austin, quite yeah, so we're three two now. Oh, goodness, <laughs> Does anybody else here from yes. like another yes. school? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so you mentioned, oh, we like the Quinnipiac poll. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you mentioned that Trump has broken a lot of political norms as president since he's been in office. Uh, when Trump is out of office, whether that be in 2020 or in 2024, do you believe that we're going to see a return to those norms? Do you think we're going to continue to see him be broken as Trump has? Excellent question. Um, I think the system, the apple cart, has been overturned. I think social media has so much of an impact now that it never used to for raising money for tweets, for all this stuff that's out there, I think that that will change. But I do believe that 
whenever the president leaves office, but I think that we will have a more calming president, be they a Republican or a Democrat, who would return to more traditional norms of what the presidency has been. And I would say this to you, uh, teaching the American presidency at NYU, look at the disruptors, right? They are Roosevelt. They didn't know what the heck to do with this guy. He was a full on China shop. He's breaking all the China everywhere. And then you get McKinley, right? And so you might think, oh my goodness, we have Trump. But you had the Air Roosevelt and you have McKinley. So I think that we'll have another McKinley. Thank you. Last question over here. Oh, sad. Last question over here. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, hi. My name is Stephen Cantalosi, also from Quinnipiac University. Oh, hey, Todd. <laughs> um, what is up with the rest of you? <laughs> and um, I'm from Long Island, New York, and that kind of plays into my questions. I have a question about your time that you spent in the White House. Um, you served in the White House. You, you were you were there during one of the most um, tumultuous periods to start off like any century, following the attacks of 9/11. Um, growing up on Long Island, personally. Although I wasn't affected, I've seen I've grown up around so many people who were affected. I know my father saw the plane stick, you know, it was it's affected many people in many ways, even down here, of course. Um, so my question to you is being in the White House at that time, um, I was wondering if you could provide any insight on what it was like trying to reach across the across the aisle, work with, you know, work with um, Democrats and other groups, considering it was so um, Difficult to reach a compromise or an idea of how the issue should be addressed. Of how do we go from, you know, how do we continue to fight to, you know, make up for what happened? Let me let me take your question and flip it a little bit and, and give you um, an insight of what it was like to be in the White House in 9/11. Hold that thought. Let me take this question and I will end with that because I think it's very important for you. You know, I look at. Pearl Harbor Day, and I look at it as something in history, and you're like, oh, Pearl Harbor Day, Pearl Harbor, that was a terrible thing, December 7th, the day of the living infamy, versus what was it like to be in the White House in 9 and what happened in the aftermath. So I'll get to that, hold that thought, I'll take your question, and then I'll try to do this in three minutes. Hello, my name is Diane, and I'm from Harvard Extension School. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my question is, um, as a number of lobbies and types of interest that are represented increase, and you've mentioned university lobbies as one example, how do you think that will affect their um, effectiveness or the way that they operate or affect change within this Washington ecosystem? I think they've been very effective. I, I look at Georgetown, and Georgetown has a number of lobbyists, and they've been really pushing hard on DACA reform. They've been pushing on immigration reform. And I find it interesting that you know, back when I worked with John Kasich, I used to just think it was just ad reform or those sorts of things. But I think that colleges and universities have really taken a leadership role in every sort of public policy position that you can think of. And they're on the Hill as often as people like me. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's good to hear what the next generation of leaders, those who are in school, um, care about. And I think they do a great job doing that. As a clarification uh, question, do you think that it, as they increase or they dilute maybe their overall effectiveness as a whole group? I think it depends on the school and I think it depends on the issue. Um, the one thing that you don't want to do in DC too much is darken the doorstep too many times because then people are like, why are you still here? <laughs> like, really? Again? So I think that less is more and that's one of the hardest things to learn in this business and I, I think that whether it's colleges and universities or, or any other entity, less is more. So let me close by saying this. I think it, it's, it's important to your question. Um, September 11th was a beautiful day in 2001. Uh, we briefed the Vice President on um, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And you, know, you see the first plane go into the, the building and you think, you know, what kind of knucklehead is this? It's a perfectly clear day in New York City. Um, you see the second um, Plane hit the second tower and realized that um, something is terribly amiss. And I just remember going down, the vice president has a ceremonial office um, on the second floor where we all worked. And I figured if anybody's going to know what's going to happen, it's going to be the Secret Service. And you go down there, and then the side door, essentially a door like that, opens, and everybody from the vice president's detail 
comes running out and they're holding some machine guns, surface air missiles, and all sorts of armament. And they just went running down the stairs. And the agent who was sitting at the desk looked at me and said, Ron, we think there's a plane coming here. Uh, you've got less than two minutes to get out of here. Stay away from the windows and get your staff out. And you, know, you realize on the second floor of the Eisenhower office executive building, um, I can't get out of here in two minutes. And so I called my parents and I said, I don't know if you guys are watching what's going on, but they think there's a plane coming here and I think I'm about to die, so I love you guys. And then I hung up the phone and you saw the best and worst of people that day. And I just remember running down the stairs in the Eisenhower Executive Office building and seeing a wide range of emotions from people. And the thing that will never move from my psyche or my consciousness is looking up and seeing from 15th Street to 17th Street on Pennsylvania Avenue. I remember the Secret Service either holding a service to air missile or a, some weapon you know, that way as we were running the other direction. Um, you know, you, you heard the plane crash of the Pentagon. Um, you know, I lost friends in the World Trade Center and on the planes. And the toughest part was coming back on September 12th. And um, everything changed from uh, domestic priorities to domestic consequences. You can still see that you know, 19 years later, I couldn't talk about 9-11 for years, of how do you reopen New York City beneath 14th Street? How do you triage the docks and the nurses, take over Governor's Island, take over the ferries, and then realize there was nobody left to save because everybody was, was dead? Um, it was a profound, um, it was a profound time to be in politics and to be in public service. And to answer your question, I think it brought the country together. You didn't look at yourself as Democrats, you didn't look at yourself as Republicans, you looked at yourself as Americans. And how can we, out of this tragedy, do good for the American people by being in these positions of responsibility? Um, and it, it was, it was a tough time, but I would say a proud time to have served um, in American government, if that gives you any sense. So I won't end on a downer. I will leave you with this. Um, work for the VP is great, because the VP has no responsibility to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we're applying to Jackson, Wyoming, and uh, he says, so have you uh, been to Wyoming before? Yes, sir, I have. He said, oh, are you going to get cowboy boots? Yes, sir, I will. And he said, so, let me help you out. So he calls this place called Corral West. He says, hello, this is Vice President. Yeah, so I'm going to send one of my staff. Oh, you'll know who it is. And uh, I go to Corral West, and I get these cowboy boots. So every time I see the Vice President and the President, they're like, stay out of the pant leg. You wearing those damn boots? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you all so, so very much for your time.